The Lord's Church is a greatly misunderstood institution, even as the Bible is not understood. And for that matter, God is not understood and His Son is not understood. Last week we talked about what happens when you misunderstand something about somebody. Well, there's so many who give lip service to God, to Christ, the Bible is the Word of God, and to what they perceive to be Christianity. But when it comes right down to what the Bible actually teaches, they simply do not know what it teaches. And the sad part about it is a great many of them are simply doing what was done by their forefathers, and that suffices. And they don't even check to see if the Bible that they laud as God's Word ever taught any such thing. Of course, that can certainly happen to members of the Lord's Church. And in the last 50 years, especially the last 30, great element has arisen in the church dissatisfied with the truth of the New Testament regarding the Lord's Church. And about everything that pertains to what we would call correctly New Testament Christianity has been challenged. All the way from authority as to what governs in the standard of right and wrong in matters religious as well as matters moral. So I hope in the coming weeks, God willing, in fact for some time, to be dealing with these fundamental matters. I have a method in my madness, and that is that I want to be developing some frequently asked questions and answers to go on a website. So I just decided, why not now? And the more I got into this, the more I realized it was not going to happen <laughs> very fast. So in, in going over and presenting this material, uh, you know, I believe in at least uh, one rock killing two birds might kill more. But so I thought, well, this is something that we need to go over in the church because we don't know the things I'm going to go over from God's good word rightly divided, then we're not going to be what we ought to be. Heaven will not be our home. So I want us to be sure we have a thus saith the Lord for everything we believe and practice about Christianity. And the question that I've chosen to deal with this morning is one that some of you will know what the Bible has to say about it, but it won't hurt for it to be reinforced. But some of you may not know. And it's a simple question. If people have enough interest to look into the Lord's church, they may very well ask this question. Why does the religious body known as the church of Christ identify itself with this particular term, the one we just noted in the question? Well, again, if there is any source book out there final standard of knowing what God thinks about anything it must be the Bible in general but more specifically where the authority of Christ our Savior is and that is in the words of his last will and testament the New Testament if you're going to say that okay let's just go and ask certain members of the church of Christ why that term is there I have no idea what you're going to hear I hate to say that, but that's just the way it is. Remember Jesus, and we have a good example then to follow along this line of posing these questions. Uh, Jesus asked his own disciples concerning himself. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And look what an answer he got. Different ones. Then when he asked them, but whom say ye that I am, Peter confessed, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, when you go to the right source, you'll get the right answer if you do your part. Now, you say, yeah, but we can make mistakes. The Lord has promised in His Word, if you knock, it'll be open to you. It is a persistent knocking. That kind of knocking never stops. That's how much you want the door of truth open to you. If you ask, the present tense verb means you never stop asking, you'll find the answer. And so on. That's what it means to be faithful to a certain cause. You're steadfast in it. You stay with it. 
And so it is that we have promised to us, if we will have the right disposition of heart, or hungering and thirsting after righteousness, if we will make sure our heart, our inward man is honest in our pursuit of the truth, and if we'll go to the right source, John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus has promised you will know the truth regarding salvation and all matters pertaining thereto, and certainly the church is regarding salvation. At least one of the things that pertains to salvation. So being that we're under the truth of Colossians 3.17, for everything we believe in practice, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, and to do something in the name of the Lord is do it, to do it by the authority of the Lord. You do it in the name of the state of Texas, you're doing it by the authority of the Texas government. And so, Christ being the absolute monarch over his kingdom, his word being law, and he reigns over the whole earth, then we go to Christ to get his authority for our beliefs and actions. And we're commanded to do that. It's obligatory upon us. We sin if we don't do it. And since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, and we're to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, then we must have a thus saith the Lord. We must have New Testament authority for everything we believe in practice. I say again, as I've said many times, if you say, in matters religion, religious or moral, I believe thus and so, then you ought to be able to go and say, here is where the Bible teaches what I believe. And when you can't find it in the Bible, then stop believing it. <laughs> because you have no proper source for your belief, and you cannot walk by faith, but you're walking by something else. So to walk by faith and not by sight, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, and we're to do only what the authority of Christ in the New Testament teaches us to do, then we're to do only as the word of God authorizes us to act. And he only authorizes us by words, either explicitly in just so many words he tells us, or implicitly, that is, he implies that such is to be done. You know the Bible applies to you today, not because... Your name and address, social security number is there, and it's written to you explicitly. But it's by implication. You know the Bible applies to you. And so we realize then that we must have the truth of God as it appears in the Word of God, the inspired Word, the infallible Word, to guide us in all things, answering this question as well as any other on matters of moral, matters of faith. So we understand that uh, the nature of language is that it communicates through direct statements. It communicates through implication. It communicates through examples. Remove that from a language, and you have nothing more than gobbledygook. It cannot communicate anything to anybody else. So it is that we know that's the way the words of the New Testament authorize us to act. And since it's the New Testament of the Christ, and Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18, then we're to let it answer for us. You see, God's already determined what's right and what's wrong. He's already determined what, uh, determined what is moral and what is uh, right in the matter of uh, religious things. So we must therefore determine what God's already determined is right or wrong. And when we point out a certain thing a man must do in order to be saved from his sins, or one must do in order to be faithful in the church as a child of God, it's not because we have invented it. It's because the Lord has revealed from his mind in words on your level of understanding in mind what he wants done and that man must do to be saved or remain faithful. And so do we have authority from the New Testament of Christ? Is it the will of Christ that we reference the church as that term is used and defined in the New Testament with the term church of Christ? Well, that term, church of Christ, is one, one term 
one of the terms that the inspired writers, inspired of the Holy Spirit to infallibly set down the will of Christ, done so in the New Testament, used to identify the church that Jesus built. Remember in Matthew 16, 18, he said in plain, simple language, I will build my church. When you turn over to Acts chapter 2, you find uh, the Lord adding to the church those that should be saved. Well, you can't add people to an institution that's not there. And that's the first time you ever read of the church being in existence and in a present tense usage. Now, he also says, or the scripture also reveals, that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. And when you go back to Acts 2 with the beginning of the church there in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost day, you find that he added all those who were saved from their sins to the church. Acts 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and he added them to the church. And 247, he added those being saved to the church. Now why should I then say that Christians, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, are found anywhere else or any other institution that is religious. Can you imagine uh, this concerning the Lord's church? Uh, sometimes when you're singing the little song, Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. On that day, Peter was a Roman Catholic. Everybody knows that. Later on, much later on, Paul was a Baptist. And on down the line, you have each one of the apostles a part of and called by denomination as they have existed roughly for 500 years. For you see, they, they sort of came along 1,500 years thereabouts after Acts 2 and the building of the Lord's church. On the cross, he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. We commemorated that death a little while ago as an act of worship which the New Testament teaches we're to engage in to show forth his death till he come again. Now think about it for a minute. When he shed his blood on the cross it was shed for the remission of our sins because he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus he's the Lamb of God. He could die innocent for the guilty. And he did. Thus his body was offered a sacrifice for our sins because no sin was known by that body. His blood was shed from that body. The life's in the blood. Thus he gave his life. He shed his blood for the remission or the forgiveness of man's sins. But the scripture then says in Acts 20 and 28 that he purchased the church with that blood. Yet people will say the church has no part to play in the salvation of man. It's very strange. The Lord's adding the saved to the church, but it has no part to play in the salvation of man. Jesus shed his blood for the remission of man's sins. He also purchased that church to which he added the saved with his blood, but it has nothing to do with our sins. It doesn't make good sense, does it? But the problem is people aren't studying their Bibles. They don't believe it's the final authority. And even in the church today, if you preach what I've preached thus far in the same way I preached it, some people will be all ruffled up completely by now because they have drank too long of the old warned over, soured, regurgitated denominational soup that passes as doctrine. In fact, today we don't have much in the way of doctrine. If you just sort of wink at heaven and think of Christ, you're as good a Christian as anybody can be. I don't think I over... Uh, simplify that attitude it's just about the way it is with everybody and you put the church in that kind of world and there will be members who will embrace it because they have so much love they can't afford to say you're lost in sin and going to hell in the way you believe and live they can't they just can't tell a person that Yet, if in a general reading of the New Testament, it says most people who ever lived on this earth and are accountable for the actions of God are going to go to hell. Well, I can't tell them that. I love them too much to keep them out of hell. You don't find that kind of preaching common today in the church that bears that name. 
But now I've said these things because everything I've said regarding the name, the term, has to do with showing why we would refer to the church in that way. But we go further. Having said what I just said, you see then that this New Testament term states the relationship of the institution of the saved, those that Christ saved, those that Christ remitted their sins, to its Savior. And it states the Savior's relationship to the body of people that He saved. Now, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, explicitly, you have salute one another with a holy kiss, the churches of Christ salute you. Now there's where the congregations of God's people were called churches of Christ. Well, preacher, don't you know it says churches, plural? Yes, it does. Because when you've got the largest and smallest organized entity of the one worldwide body of Christ that Christ said he would build and did build, Matthew 16, 18, Acts chapter 2, being a congregation like this one in any geographic location, then it's obvious when you've got the church at Spring and the church somewhere else and you put two of them together, at least two, you've got churches. And that helps us know, too, why we should know definitely the way the word church is defined and used in your New Testament. And I will remind you here that the word church is used in meaning the one institution Jesus purchased with his blood, which he built, which we talked about, beginning in Acts 2. The word church is also used to refer to a congregation, the largest and smallest organized into the other one body of Christ at any geographic location, such as the church here. And the third way the word church is used is to refer to an assembly convened for religious purposes such as this assembly right here this morning. And you have uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, the Holy Spirit through Paul writing part of the New Testament discussed the church as an assembly, writing to a church in a certain geographic location which is a part of the one New Testament church. Now, those are the three ways in which the word church is used in the New Testament and in no other way as far as the realm of the saved is concerned. Now, if we're going to do what we're told to do, rightly divide or handle aright the word of truth in the study of the Scriptures that we might not stand ashamed before God, 2 Timothy 2.15, then when it comes to the usage of the word church in the New Testament of the Christ, then we're settled with that and we're happy to know that. Now, somebody says, how do you know that that's the only way that the word, or ways, the word church is used and defined? Well, let me just tell you, I can read and understand the English language and take the necessary time to do the study of God's will pertaining to my going to heaven or hell and read it and understand it. And so can you. But not if you're going to seek everything else on the face of this earth that's fleshly and timely before you ever sit down and study your Bible. There'll be a lot of things you don't know. If your job's more important to you than the study of the Bible, plan to be in hell. You say, well, why do you say that? I can read my Bible. I can understand it because God gave it to me to read it and understand it. And I know what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto me. If you love to go to work, have a job that lets you have the weekends off to hunt, fish, do whatever you do, sleep late or whatever, and that's all that matters to you, don't expect heaven when you die. If you love to make all the money there is to make and then some, and your idea of enough money is a little bit more, you're not going to go to heaven. Just plan on hell. You see, hell's a prepared place for prepared people, just as heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And when you're preparing yourself to go to hell, why do you expect heaven? People won't deal with that, but they ought to. They must, in fact, if they would be saved. So when you look to the authority of Christ, which we must have for what we believe in practice, we look to the church, we understand the usage of the word church, we understand it from God's perspective, 
And we realize that we must form that view in our own mind to be right with God and our attitude toward it. And then we look at the way in the New Testament that um, the Holy Spirit is referred to it. And we see Romans 16, 16, that he refers to it as the churches of Christ. Since we know the word church is uh, used and defined in three ways, we see then he's talking about, as we say today, congregations of the Lord's people, the church. But it's not the only way that the church is referred to by the inspired writers. Other terms are employed by the inspired writers whereby the institution of the saved is designated. Now let me emphasize here there is no term in the New Testament referencing the church that is a proper name. Like Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, or David Brown, or Alan Whaley, or Tommy Taylor, or whoever. They're only terms of designation. I say it again. They're only terms of designation for the Lord's church. Some of those scriptural terms are in Acts 20 and 28, Church of God. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, he refers to uh, the body of Christ. Also, uh, church of God used in 1 Corinthians. Um, body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. The body, Colossians 1, 18. Then he says the same thing in discussing the church regarding the body being the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. In writing Timothy, he talks about that if I tarry, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of God. Well, what does he mean? He says the house of God. What does it mean to have the house of God? It's the family of God. And so we need to understand that that term used, house of God or family of God. The word kingdom, which means the same thing as church and body, is referred to as the kingdom of Christ. Matthew 16, 18, Colossians 1, 13. There are other terms, I think, right now, of Hebrews chapter, I believe it's 13, uh, somewhere around verse 28. Maybe it's, no, it's chapter 12, I believe, verse 28. It's referred to as the flock of God. The flock of God. Now, you see, there's no particular proper name. They're just scriptural inspired terms to designate the church. And in every one of those designations, you can understand something about the nature of the church. Not talking about different institutions. The Lord built only one church. And he used the word church and kingdom interchangeably in Matthew 16. Talking about the same institution that comprises all the, all the same. So I say again, there are no proper names for the Lord's church found in the New Testament. There are only terms of designation to identify the church. We are actually in answering all these questions going to see the New Testament identifying marks of the church. You know we talk about fingerprints to set me apart in my fleshly body from everybody else. Uh, you can now do it with the eyes and you can do it, uh, that is with the retina as far as I understand. And uh, then you can do it in so far as um, uh, deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA, and it makes you, though like all other humans, bearing the characteristic attributes of humans, it sets you apart as one human from every other human on this earth. And the IRS can find you if they want to and set you apart from everybody else. Now, if that can happen regarding that level, what about when it comes to the most important thing on earth, that is going to heaven rather than going to hell? And accepting the Lord's will written on our level of understanding when it comes to the Lord's church. Thus, we refer to the church as the churches of Christ or the church of Christ. The church is of Christ. He built it. Christ adds a Savior to the church. It is a scriptural term. There are other terms, but this is also a scriptural term. It's been commonly accepted by the Lord's church over all the years to refer to as the church of Christ, but nobody said it was an exclusive term and no other term in the scriptures could be used to refer to the realm of the saved. If somebody believes that, they just know what they're talking about. Because you can just go read your New Testament. Yeah, read it, read it. Think about the words. Look at everything pertaining to the church. My, look at the helps that are out there. Go get your strong concordant and look up church and just start down it. Oh, so much has already been done for us to help us write and divide the word of truth. And they did it without a computer except this one, and the determination to spend the time necessary in the study of the Bible to learn the truth. Can you imagine? I, I do this every once in a while. Pick up 
the, any one of the good concordances, cruisers, but especially Strong's is used more today probably than any other, and realize he did that with no typewriter, no mechanical computer. He did that laboriously through many years of finding, let's take the word church, everywhere in the Bible the word church was used. Now he did that with all the helps we have today. And we can't find time to do things. Well, yeah, but I've got too many demands on my time. Then prepare for hell. You don't have time's here to find God. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, whatever else measures up to that and is more important than that. If it's more important than that, you're not ready to go to heaven. And you won't. It's that simple. Let me show you how much time we spend with the Bible. How many of you can name the books of the New Testament? As you answer it, I won't have to know, but God knows. <laughs> How many of you can name the books of the New Testament? And it doesn't bother you at all to say, I can't. Don't want anybody to know it, but I can't. And tomorrow I'll be doing what I really love to do. You say, but I don't like my job. You like the money. There's a whole host of folks in jobs right now that wouldn't be doing those jobs if it weren't for what? Paycheck at the end of the week. In fact, if you could, you'd like to say, I'd like to find a job where I could so and so and so and so. <laughs> Brethren, your days are numbered as mine are. And it's going to come to an end before you can blink an eye and maybe before you ever get home to eat whatever it is being cooked or burnt. Now, are you ready to meet your maker? Now, you say, how does this have to do with what does the religious body known as the Church of Christ, why, why does it identify itself? Because the same efforts to find out what Jesus has authorized his church to be called is the same effort you put into it to say, what must I do to be saved from my sins? Or maybe to say, what is sin? And then to say, why should I be concerned about sin one way or the other? How important is sin? A whole host of folks out here in every facet of our society are saying, sin is no big deal. Evidently, it wasn't from the beginning. The devil knew the will of heaven for Adam and Eve as well as they did. He didn't care. He was a liar from the beginning. And he told them exactly it was not so. So is it important that we refer to the body of the saved in a scriptural way? Well, Peter said, if any man speak, are you any man? Let him speak as the oracles of God. We're all taught to do as the Lord's authorized us to do. Now, why do that? Well, do you want your life acceptable to God? Well, I can't be perfect in the first place. Okay. Then you don't know the system of salvation and the gospel system that makes a man perfect with God through faithful adherence and obedience to His will all the days of your life. And thus, you're proving your ignorance and how much you need to have the understanding of the Bible. So... Why do we refer to ourselves as faithful Christians, as the church of Christ? Like the old man said one time, we got Bible for it. And in a day when the Bible is repudiated, made a lot of, put down, and castigated in every way possible, let us not be ashamed of it. It's the Word of God. And on that final day, when all men come before the judgment bar of Christ, they will give an account of what they thought, said, and done on the basis of the standard that is the New Testament standard. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. This man being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Listen, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We often sing, take Christ at his word. Well, I take him at his word. For Jesus also said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Now, you know ahead of time the standard of judgment before you get there. And you say, well, I just won't go. You don't even believe that about being called in for an audit by the IRS. And this is the God of all the earth, and you think you just won't go? 
You'll be there, and you'll stand all by yourself before the judgment bar of God, and you'll give an account of your thoughts, words, and actions on the basis of the teaching of this perfect law of liberty. And you've already got the assignment. You know the standard. You know you need to study it. And from the standpoint all the way from how do we refer to the body of the saved to anything else that pertains to life and godliness, this book is sufficient to give us the wherewithal in any area. We do not stand apologetic to anybody in the sense of saying, well, I'm sorry I had to preach this. What I've taught you this day on these principles is absolutely essential. If you don't believe it, you won't be saved. Just plan on going to torment. Now you say, well, you sound like you're happy. No, I'm just telling you the facts of it. it facts can't be stated in any way but factually. I plead with you. I've shown you the way to come out of that. But you see, it all comes back down to, to me. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Christ wants you to be saved. He couldn't demonstrate it any more than how he demonstrated it. God wants you to be saved. He couldn't demonstrate it any more than the way he's demonstrated in giving his only begotten son, demonstrating his love for the world. But then as free moral agents, we have to respond to the gospel call of coming to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You can. You don't have to. God will not force it on you. But he reasons with you from the scripture saying, does it make sense to prepare yourself for eternity, to meet him in the judgment, and to meet him as a saved person, not as one lost. Now, to become a Christian, one must, with all of his heart, believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. We're assuming you already know you must believe in God. To repent of your sins, Acts 17.30, confess your faith in the Christ, and then complete your obedience to Him to become a Christian and be added to the church in so doing by being baptized for the remission of sins, baptized into Christ. As a child of God, how much of your time are you giving to learning how to live for the Lord, to glorify His name, and to set a better example for Christ on this earth? It's left up to you, but if you've sinned in living the Christian life, we urge you to repent of those sins and come to Christ in confession of them and praying for forgiveness. And once again, be strong in the Lord and live for Him. And do so now while we stand and sing.